2 Peter chapter 1. Then look down at verse 16. Peter the Apostle writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit these words. For we did not follow, for we do not follow clever, cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have a prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but, God, but man moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we come before you. We thank you for this text in 2 Peter. We pray that you speak to our hearts and that you lead us and guide us and direct us, Father, and help us to see these seven wonders of your word. Lead us and guide us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, you may recall that we looked at the first four, and I said that wonder number one was, number one was the Bible's divine inspiration. Wonder number two was the Bible's unique formation. Wonder number three was the Bible's widespread circulation. Number four was the Bible's honest confirmation. This morning we're going to see number five, and it is called the Bible's enduring perseverance, or preservation. The Bible's enduring preservation. The Bible has endured through the ages like unlike any other book. The writer of Psalm 119, verse 89, wrote this. He says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Throughout the time of the beginning of the written word of God, the Bible has had many enemies throughout those centuries. One Roman emperor in 303 A.D. issued an edict to destroy all Bibles in Christians. It was estimated that by the end of his reign that only 50 copies of the Bible survived the attack. Just a few years later, another emperor rose to power by the name of Constantine, and he ordered additional copies of the Bibles to be made at the government's expense. And not only did he do that, but he said, I am going to legalize Christianity in the Roman Empire. For centuries, the Bible was only translated into the Greek and Latin. And I find it amazing that during that time when the Bible, the Holy Word of God, was translated just into the Greek and just into the Latin, in the historical setting, we know that time period as the Dark Age. Kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? Because, see, the only copies of the Bibles were in the churches, and only the professional clergy would read it. But as history shows us and tells us that even few of them actually read the Word of God. During that, Bible, during that time, the Bible became more and more of a shrine than anything else. But then in the early 14th century, scholars like John Wycliffe, Wycliffe, Wycliffe started translating the Bible into the English. So the common man, the common woman could understand it in and you didn't have to have Greek or Latin to read the Word of God. But in 1408, Wycliffe's handwritten copies, imagine that, handwritten copies of the English Bible was burned. Later on, a gentleman by the name of William, William Tyndale, blessed William Tyndale, he continued to make the effort to make the Bible available to everyone. 
William Tyndale was appalled by the lack of biblical knowledge of his day. And most importantly, he was appalled by the lack of knowledge of even the official clergymen of his day. But after translating the New Testament into English where everyone could read it, Tyndale was arrested by the church and he was arrested for heresy. And on October the 6th, 1536, William Tyndale, the lover of the word of God, was strangled and then burned at the stake. Just for changing the word of God from the Greek and the Latin to the English. The Bible has been attacked, it's been abused, it's even been outlawed, but yet it still lives on, praise God. And as one writer put it, and I read this, and I thought, you know, I was going to put it in the message, and I thought, no, I'm not. And then I thought, you know, after reading it again and praying about it, I thought, oh, yes, I am, because it's a wonderful statement. Here's what one, how one writer put it. He said, the Bible is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. I like that. Many of you have studied and many of you have heard about the French atheist known as Voltaire. Voltaire was a man who mocked the Bible. He mocked Christians. And he lived during a terrible time of change and that change of called enlightenment where we got away from the Bible. The Bible was no longer relevant. We need to be enlightened. We need to think for ourselves. Well, sometimes, yes, we do, but we never need to put the Bible away, do we? But that was the time period in which Voltaire lived. And Voltaire predicted that within 100 years from his time, that there would not be one Bible or one Christian left on the earth. He said because enlightenment and people's own mental thinking and people knowing for who they are, and besides that, there is no God, Voltaire said. There would be no Bible, and all these people run around here on earth that call themselves Christian, they would all fade away. Now, I find it amazing that Voltaire died in 1778. And within just 50 years, the very home that Voltaire lived in and owned and spewed out his, his hatred for the Bible and for Christians, that very home that he lived in became the headquarters of what was known as the Geneva Bible Society, and they printed Bibles and handed out Bibles to the Frenchmen of the day. I find that amazing how God does those things. Today, Voltaire is gone. Very as little taught about him, but my beloved friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, the word of God lives on. Well, let's look at wonder number six, the Bible's prophetic validation. Peter says in verse 19, he says, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which we do well to pay attention. The Bible contains over 2,000 statements of prophecy, and many of which have already occurred. You know, I remember as a young boy growing up and my grandmother being a believer, and she would talk about Bible prophecy. And I remember her saying about how Bible prophecy would happen. She'd, she'd tell me, she'd said, oh, Bruce, you, you know what happened in the news today? Yeah, Grandma, I, I heard. That's, that's what the Bible was talking about here. And she'd show me a passage of scripture. And maybe it'd be five, six, seven, eight, ten years later, and she'd say, Bruce, you remember when watching the news the other night and this happened? Yeah, Grandma. Well, listen to what the Bible says. And I was amazed. But there was years apart. Beloved, listen, we are living in a time when Bible prophecy is being fulfilled by the hand of Almighty God day after day after day after day. And what you hear in the news, what you hear on the television, the radio, read in the newspaper, go to the Word of God and God will tell you it's already going to happen and why it's going to happen. The Bible tells us that God himself uses prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, Isaiah writes this. God is speaking. He says, For I am, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, Declares, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things which have not been done. You want to know what's going on in the world today? 
Read the newspaper. You want to know what's going on in the world yesterday? Watch television. You want to know what's going on in the world tomorrow and next year and the next year after that? Read the Bible. Bible prophecy, I've heard it been told this way, Bible prophecy is simply the history in reverse. It's God telling us what's going to happen before it even happens. And there are different kinds of prophecies in the Bible. But this morning, for the sake of time, I only want, want us to consider two of them. And the first one is the historical prophecy. The number one historical prophecy is Israel is to be resettled in the land known as Israel. It used to be called Palestine. We need to call it Israel because that's what the Bible calls it. Amen? God made a covenant to a man named Abraham and his descendants, and Abraham represented the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And God made that covenant with him and with his descendants forever, and that God would give them a land of their own. Now, I want you this morning, and I thought about this, I want you this morning, I don't want you to get confused by what's known as a vow, and that's what you do in a wedding. You say vows. Or in the word covenant. They're two different things. A vow can be broken by certain conditions, can it not? When you take a vow to do something, it, it, it is always hinged on a conditional thing that if this doesn't happen, I can get out of it because that did not take place. And it's a vow. But once a covenant has been spoken and it has been spoken into existence, and especially by an everlasting God, it is everlasting. Amen? God does not break his covenant. God, and I'm going to repeat myself here again in just a few minutes, God is a covenant keeper. This covenant that God made with Abraham and with Abraham's descendants, Isaac and Jacob and all the rest forever, it was what is known as a blood covenant. Now, we don't understand that in our society today, a blood covenant. But let me tell you this morning, there are two very important blood covenants in the Bible. The first one was this one between God and Abraham. When God gave Abraham and his descendants forever the land for all eternity, it was done through a blood covenant. You know the second blood covenant? Yeah, I'm hearing you say it. It's when Jesus Christ hung up on the cross and he shed his blood. That was a blood covenant. The second blood covenant was the shedding of the precious blood of the Lamb of God on Calvary's cross for removing the curse of sin for all mankind. And again, beloved, God is a covenant keeper. If God will break, and I've heard people say this, well, God has broken that first covenant and he no longer has to deal with Israel, let me tell you something. A blood covenant, if you read and study what a blood covenant is, it is so important to God that if he was to break that covenant with Israel, what makes him, you and I believe that he will keep his covenant with you and I through the blood of Jesus Christ? Amen? He will keep both of them. For all eternity. Now the Bible does teach that there is a right to possession. God gave the Jewish people that land known as Israel. But there's also the right of inhabitants to inhabit the land. And if you ever read and if you ever study the book of Deuteronomy, that book records the last message of Moses. It, it, it records his message right before Israel conquers Canaan. And Deuteronomy tells us more than any other book of this firm condition in, 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 to living in the land of Canaan. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 8, we read these words, You shall therefore keep every covenant which I am commanding you. Now, who, who wrote, who's speaking there? God. Today, 
so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it. You're going to possess it, Israel. You're going to possess it, Jewish people. But in to live in it, you've got to live according to my words. If Israel wants to dwell there for an extended period of time, they need to do so, the Bible tells us, as a holy people. That means the right of possession is clearly according to the word and promises of God, and the land is forever Israel, but the, the right to dwell in that land is based upon spiritual conditions of the Jewish people. And please don't let any person tell you of a false teaching, of a false theology known as replacement theology. Replacement theology, just in a nutshell, is saying because the Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that the church has now taken the place of Israel with all the blessings, and all Israel gets is the cursing. Well, you know what? I'm going to be upfront and honest with you today as only I know how. That philosophy, that teaching, that theology of replacement theology has its origin in one place. It's called the pit of hell. Because just like God made that blood covenant with you and I at the cross of Calvary through the blood and the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood, he made a blood covenant with the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, that the land of Israel is theirs. The land is forever Israel's. But the right, as I said, is based upon spiritual conditioning of the Jewish people. God also prophesied through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that there are firm conditions to living in that land, as we've been saying. In chapter 28, of the, it's called the blessing and the curse chapter. It sums up in a rather dramatic way. If Israel walks in the way of, of their Lord, their God, he will bless them in the land which the Lord gave to them. But if Israel constantly refuses to walk according to his word, and follow other gods and does not walk according to his words and, and follows other gods, the ultimate consequence is to be found in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 63. You will be torn from the land there. You are entering to possess it. Now, you're going to possess it, but you're going to be moved out. And what happened to Israel? Israel started walking with other gods. They started praying to other gods. They started believing in other gods. And what happened? Was it still their land? Oh, yes. But they weren't obedient to God. So other groups drove them out. But God gave the land to Abraham and his descendants forever. Then starting in the early 1900s, the Jewish people started returning to the Holy Lands. You know why we call it the Holy Lands? You know why? Because God is holy. And he gave that land to the Israeli people, to the Jewish people. And any time God does something, it's holy. Amen? Then in 1948, May 14, 1948, Israel was chartered as a nation for the first time in over 2,000 years. But you know what? It didn't happen to take the charter of the United Nations. Because Amos says over in Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, God predicts that it, it would happen. In Amos 9, 14 and 15, it says, Also, I will restore the captivity of my people, Israel, and they will rebuild the, their ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out. From their land, which I have given to them, says the Lord your God. See, God already said way back in Amos what the UN Charter said in May of 1948. And for centuries, the Holy Lands, that land over there in the Middle East, laid in ruins as it was under the control of the Turks and the Arabs and so many tribes that controlled them. It was such a desert place that when a gentleman from Missouri, a man by the name of Mark Twain, went over there in 1867, here's how he described what we call the Holy Land. He said, it's a desolate country 
whose soul is rich enough but is given wholly to weeds, hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. He said even the olive trees and the cactuses, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. That's, that's a pretty bleak picture, isn't it, by Mr. Twain? But see, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, started going back to Israel. And then finally, like I've been saying, in May of 1948, Israel became a nation unto their own. And Israel became under their own control. And, and if you've ever seen pictures of Israel today, you know that it is a beautiful, lush area. They have taken an area that was nothing more than a desert and have turned it into beautiful farmlands. God said in Isaiah 27 and verse 6, in the, in the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will blossom and sprout and they will fill the whole world with their fruit. And we're seeing that happen, have we not? Today, the farmers in Israel, the, the Jewish farmers, listen, they export their fruit to every continent on the face of this earth. Every continent on the face of this earth will receive produce from the nation of Israel. You wouldn't think that by reading and hearing what Mark Twain had to say about it. The second is the mess Messianic prophecy. And that details, uh, details about Jesus because over four, 700 years before Jesus was born in that little city of Bethlehem, the prophets of the Old Testament had many predictions about the details of his life. But we're just going to let the scriptures tell us this morning. First of all, there's the virgin birth. We all know about it. We know the story in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. I'll give you that. You can read that later. But let me tell you what Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 says. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall name him Emmanuel. Then what about the place of his birth? Well, we all know what Luke chapter 2 verses 4 and 6 says. But listen to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem of Ephraim, too little to be among the clans of Judah, for you, from you, one will go forth from me to be ruler of Israel. His goings forth are from so long ago, from the days of eternity. Then I find this about the amazing, amazing thing of the messianic prophecy, about the betrayal of a friend. We all know in Matthew 27, verses 3 through 7, how Judas Iscariot betrayed him and how he betrayed him for 30 pieces of uh, coins, 30 coins. But listen to what Zechariah says. Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 through 13 says, I said to them, if it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and I threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Kind of reminds you of what happened in Matthew, doesn't it? With Judas, he took 30 pieces of silver from, from the religious leaders he realized that he had betrayed an innocent man and he goes back to him and he tries to give it to him and they said, we can't take it because it's blood money. What does Matthew tells us? It tells us that he throws it at them. Where were they at? In the house of the Lord. And then what did they do with the 30 pieces of uh, silver? They went out and bought Potter's Field, a graveyard. And then there's the fourth is the crucified. In Psalm chapter 22, verse 16, it says, For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Luke 23 and verse 33 says, And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. 
He died among thieves. That's the number five. Isaiah 53, 9 says, His grace was assigned with wicked men. While Luke 22 and verse 32 says, Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. Number six, we all know the story. In John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, verses 23 through 24, about them casting lots for his clothes. But in Psalm 22, verse 18, it says, The, the divided of my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Then what about him being buried, number seven, in the rich man's tomb? Now we all know what Matthew 27 says. But over way back there in Isaiah 53 and verse 9, it says, Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no evil, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. We have the historical and we have the messianic prophecies, don't we? And beloved, listen, don't miss this. Every single one of those messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that talks about one day the Messiah would come was fulfilled in the man, Jesus Christ. Every single one. Not one was missing. You go to the Old Testament from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament and you find prophecies talking about the Messiah and you go to the New Testament especially to the Gospels that we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you will see that Jesus Christ fulfilled every single one. He is Messiah. Well, wonder number seven, the Bible's personal application. We've seen six different proofs and validations about the Bible and how they stand for God's unique word. But I think this number seven sets it apart unlike any other book that has ever been written. And I kind of touched on it at the end of my sermon last week. No other book can claim credit as the Bible can because the Bible is the only book, the only holy book, that can lead you and I to salvation. It's the only one. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, And that from childhood you have known that sacred writing, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. I ended last week's sermon. I'm not done yet. <laughs> but I remember being leading last week's sermon, and I said, I've never heard a man say, well, I read Natural, National Geographic, and I quit beating my wife. Well, I read this book, and I stopped doing this. I, start, I stopped reading Time Magazine, and I quit being an alcoholic. I've never heard of anybody doing that, have you? But I'll tell you what, you know and I know, and we've seen people and we know people who have said, I've read this book, and I quit abusing my wife. I quit abusing my children. I've read this book, and I took it to heart, and I accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. This book, this holy book that you have and I have, it can do so much good that it's a shame that we're not out talking about it more. It really is. Years ago, I taught a Bible study. And part of the Bible study was on what was called, at that time, it was called the hand illustration. And it was just a simple tool of using one's hand to show you and to show I, myself, how, how we can get a firm grip on the Word of God. So we're going to do a little interaction. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in the, in the pew rack in front of you. Grab it. Let's do this together. Take the Bible and put it in the palm of your hand like that. 
Or maybe you want to turn it this way. Now, hopefully, your fingers can stretch. <laughs> maybe not. But if you want to get into the Word of God and you want to get a firm gra grasp to the Word of God, we're going to let this little finger represent hearing the Word of God. You're hearing the Word of God this morning. Amen? The preacher's preaching it. A Sunday school teacher teaches it. You're hearing the Word of God. So there you go. You got your little finger there. The next finger, it's called your ring finger. Why is it called your ring finger? Well, because in this case, that's the finger that has my ring on it. It represents reading the Word of God. Now, if I just hear the Word of God and I just read the Word of God, somebody can pretty well snatch it out of my hand pretty fast, can't they? I need to do both but I don't have a firm grasp on it. And then there's your middle finger, and it represents studying the Word of God. So if I hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, and study the Word of God, I can hold on to it a little bit better, can I? It's not going to be as easily pulled out of my life and out of my hands. But then let's go to that pointing finger, and let's put him there. And that represents memorizing the Scripture. Now, I know we all have trouble memorizing things. I know that. You know, I, back years ago when I started memorizing Scripture, I thought to myself, I don't understand why anybody can't remember or memorize Scripture. Well, the older I get, I'm having more trouble memorizing things. But I believe with all my heart we can still do it. Amen? So we memorize the Scripture. Now, we're hearing the Scripture. We're reading the Scripture. We're studying the Scripture. And we're memorizing the Scripture. It gets a little harder to pull it out of your hand, doesn't it? But now let's say the old thumb. Can't leave it out. It represents meditating on the Word. Pondering over the Word. Thinking of what you read this morning. Not what the preacher said, but what you read. And so we hear the Word of God. We read the Word of God. We study the Word of God. We memorize the Word of God. We meditate on the Word of God. And we got a good grip, grasp on that Bible, don't we? Amen? How easy would it be for Satan to pull it out of your hand if you've got it like that? He can't do it, can he? Because it's there. We need to do those things, brothers and sisters. We need to hear the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. We need to memorize the Word of God, and then we need to meditate upon the Word of God. Maybe another word for meditation is to apply the Word of God. And when you and I start doing that, we will live more and more of a sinless life because we'll know what the Bible says. Now, let's do some application time, all right? In 2004, there was a gentleman by the name, and I hope I and pray I get it right. His first name, he is Dr. Gaylord Kambara Amy. Kambara Amy. He was the general secretary from the International Bible Society in Zimbabwe, in Africa. And this man was going around the city of Zimbabwe, and he was handing out New Testament Bibles, just the New Testament. And he came upon a man and he handed him, the Bible started to hand him the New Testament, and the man looked at him and told him that he was a very deep skeptic of the Word of God. And this doctor, this general secretary of the International Bible Society there in Zimbabwe said, well, I still want to give it to you. The man looked up at him and said, well, I'll take it, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a page a day, because I guess it was one of those little New Testaments. He said, I'm going to take a page a day and rip it out and roll my tobacco in it and smoke it. I'll use it as tobacco paper. And the doctor said, well, you know, that's all right. You do that, but I want you to promise me one thing. Will you promise me one thing? And the man said, sure, I'll promise you one thing. He said, before you take that page and rip it out and roll your tobacco in there and smoke it, he said, read the page, the front and the back. He said, then go ahead and put your tobacco in there and roll it and smoke it. He said, feel free. Well, some years later, there was another Bible conference over in Africa. 
This same general secretary of the Bible Society was there. And guess who else was there? The deep smoking skeptic. He was there because he had become an evangelist in his area. This general secretary went up to him and he said, you may not remember me, but I was the man that handed you that New Testament and you told me you were a deep skeptic of the Bible and that if I gave you that little New Testament, all you were going to do is tear out the page and the guy finished the story. He said, yes, and I told you I was going to tear it out and roll up my tobacco in and smoke it. And the general secretary looked at me and he said, and what did I ask you? He said, you asked me to promise you one thing. He said, which I did. He said, you asked me to take that page and before I rolled my tobacco in and smoked it, to read it front and back. And Dr. Kambar Amy said, well, did you do it? He said, well, I have to confess. He said, I smoked through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He said, but when I got to John 3, 16, he said, I couldn't smoke it. He said, and I laid it down, got on my knees, and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You can't do that with Time Magazine. You cannot do that with Popular Mechanic. You cannot do it with Red Book or whatever magazines or books that you women read. You can't do it. But see, even a man that is a deep skeptic of the Bible and uses the pages to smoke cigarettes, got to John 3, 16, and it changed his life forever. The Holy Bible is a wonderful book. Amen? Because it's written by and written about a wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 19 says, You will do well to pay attention. Pay attention to what? Pay attention to the Word of God. As a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. This book, because that's what my sermon last week said, this book, it says Bible, that's what it means, book. But see, then we add on that word holy, don't we? And holy means to set apart. So this holy book, starting from Genesis to the very end of the book, in the book of the Revelation, is an amazing book. It's a, an amazing holy book that can change lives forever. It can change the unsaved to the saved. And some of you may be here this morning, some of you may be listening this morning, and you say, well, Pastor, I've already accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I don't need the Bible for that part. Well, you know what? You may be going through some dark spiritual times right now of just being obedient to God. You may be going through some dark spiritual times of, of things coming upon you that you feel you just can't handle anymore. Let me encourage you this morning to get into the Word of God. And it will bring you out of those dark spiritual times. Because that's what Almighty God, the author and finisher of this holy book, wants to do. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for this, this holy book, this holy Bible, how it can change lives from being lost to being saved, from sinner to saint. But it doesn't stop there, Father. This holy Bible, this holy book, with you as its author, using so many other different people in three different other languages, it is a wonderful book. And even we as Christians need and must read this holy word that we will walk in obedience to you. 
Father, speak to our hearts today and help us to see that your word is precious. It is wonderful. Because it tells a wonderful story about a wonderful Savior who loves us and cares for us. And he does not want to see any of us perish and go to hell. But he wants every single one of us to become a child of his. Father, lead us and guide us, I pray. And while this message may have been different, not like most, I pray that you use the words of, the, of your word in people's lives. Speak to our hearts, Father God, and I pray that if anybody has a, has, a, has a need, Father God, whether it's just to pray or whatever, that they will come to these front pews and pray to you. Or if they don't want to draw attention and they just want to sit where they are and pray, Father, bear on their heart that they need to pray. But Father, you do your work in our lives, and we'll give you all the praise, and we'll give you all the honor. And we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and turn in your hymnal to page 305, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. And if God is speaking to your heart, you be obedient. Don't resist Him. If God is speaking to you and telling you to do something, you obey the Spirit promptly. He said, in this world, it is thought a mighty thing to be alive. Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.